Wow, good morning. That is quite an audience. It's reflecting this morning. If somebody would have told me a year ago when I was sitting semi-retired on a beach in Southern California, that I'd be standing here today as the CEO of the largest Canadian cannabis company speaking to you, I would have laughed you out of the room. So very excited to be here. I've got part of my team with me. We're, we're excited to share a little bit of our learnings of our journey with you. But what we really want to focus on is, is what does the future of the cannabis industry potentially look like for, for all of us? And I like the remarks previously made about how this is our industry and how we can shape it. And I think we should take that really seriously. So I think about cannabis 1.0 as having been the cannabis that led all the way up to the legalization, or I should say the state legalization in Colorado. Kind of cannabis 2.0 is the phase that we're in right now. So Canada obviously less than a month ago legalized, and when we are now shaping the future of the industry, not only in Canada, but in the US and increasingly globally. And what I want to spend some time on is the learnings that I've had in my career working for large Fortune 500 companies in more mature segments to see if there's anything in there that we can learn so we can shape an industry in cannabis 3.0 in which we can continue to prosper. So we're out of the blocks. We're out of the blocks here with MJ Biz. I'm excited to be part of the kickoff to kind of hopefully set the stage a bit for you the next couple of days that you will spend learning and learning from the thousand companies that are here that are driving their business. But the starting block mentality is really also what we should look at at the industry. I'm always amazed being new to this industry, the questions that I get from media and from, from partners, when they act as if this is a mature industry, when they talk about, oh, supply and demand are overlapping and prices are gonna go down. And we're having conversations that we had in beer after 200 years or in soft drinks after 100 years, and they're already beginning to creep up. And I think they're misguided. I think they're way too early. You know, we are literally out of the starting block, out of a starting block of what, without a doubt, will be a marathon. It feels, for many of us that are in the industry, like a, a hundred sprints right next to each other, so it's slightly exhausting, but at the same time, it's exhilarating. And I couldn't help sitting in the back listening to the comments saying, oh yeah, Colorado slowed down to 15% growth. I can't even begin to tell you how I think about 15% growth. You know, at, at, uh, at Coke, at Molson Coors, we fought with tens of millions of dollars to stand still for decades. Literally, 0.1% market share. Those are the conversations that are going on, you know, when you're part of one of these big companies, and here we're talking about, yeah, you know, 15% growth, we really gotta be careful now. It's not even funny, it's so funny. <laughs> so when you think about the Coca-Cola company, I was really, really lucky. You know, I came from Germany uh, in 1993, started working for Coke in 94 in the global marketing team in Atlanta. And my God, it's been a hell of a ride. You know, the first couple of years were incredible. 1994 through 1998, stock price quintupled. On my Excel spreadsheet, I was gonna retire at 32 and the world's gonna be my oyster. Well, it turns out it didn't quite play out that way. You know, and it's incredible to believe that a company like Coca-Cola, one of the best companies in the world to this day, I spent 17 years there, proceeded after 1998 to today, 20 years later, to create precisely zero value. That is an astonishing thing when you talk, when you think about that. So as we think about 15% growth not being sufficient, think about no growth for 20 years in one of the best companies in the world. And that's reflected in the values and the share prices you know, that the shareholders get. That is an amazing thing. So an incredible boom, and then call it a bust, call it a consolidation, call it the arrival of maturity. What does that mean potentially for us here in the industry of cannabis? Then I joined Molson Coors. Molson Coors was, again, phenomenal. You know, so I joined as Molson Coors really stepped up their globalization pace, global brands. I um, was fortunate to be a part of an amazing journey. They tripled that share price to over $110 two years ago. The truth is, after that boom, has come a not so exciting last two years where the share price basically halved. Again, being part of dynamics of that, and you know, lucky that I was not part of the dynamics after that $110 share price, but think about what it would be like to work in companies in mature industries that go through this day to day that fight to stand still, that try not to lose, that create strategies that allow them to keep the doors open and keep paying the employees. 
And then contrast that with what we're doing. I was walking through the hallway this morning. It's just, you can't believe it, right? I mean, the size of this room is maybe bigger than any beer or Coca-Cola soft drink uh, industry event that I've ever spoken at. And we're in our baby steps. We're just beginning this journey. So I want us all to really embrace this incredible opportunity and contrast that with what has happened. So when you take some of the largest Fortune 500 companies and what's happened to their values over the last couple of years, take in this case really the market capitalization over the last two years, this is what happened with a company like Molson Coors. And then, I don't know if Bruce is here, but contrast that with what Canopy has done over that same period of time. So here's a company, Molson Coors. Molson founded in 1786. Coors founded in 1873. 230 years of one of the largest brewers in the world, you know, creating value and then really struggling to maintain that value. And along comes uh, Canopy. And within two years, creates a company that's more valuable than one of, one of the three largest brewers in the world, in an industry that's been around for hundreds of years. Think about that. And we are part of that industry, and we have an opportunity to take that to that next level. So sometimes it takes on crazy forms, right? So you might all be familiar with our friends at Tilray and, and Brendan Kennedy and his team obviously have done a phenomenal job. They turned the world upside down. They launched here in the US, as was pointed out earlier, in July. And within three months, they're more valuable than Molson Coors, who's been in business for 230 years. So think through the scale of the value that's being created for us, for our shareholders, but for all these smaller and larger businesses here and around the world that can take advantage of this opportunity that increasingly represents itself. Now, you know, this chart, I don't know how closely you, you, you follow Tilray, but it's quite remarkable, right? They launched in July, the share price was at $17. They were worth $1.7 billion. And maybe some of you saw that crazy day when their stock price reached 300 three months later, times 20. At that point in time, they were worth $30 billion, almost twice as much as Molson Coors. Within months, weeks, and days, that much value has been created in Canopy and Tilray sit up there now of course, owned by, by Constellation in Canopy's case, taking advantage of this opportunity. And I'd encourage you all here over the next couple of days and weeks and months and years, really, to be aware of what a privilege it is for all of us to be in this industry. And with that comes the responsibility, I think, to shape it so that the boom continues and the globalization presents these, uh, these chances. I disagree a little bit with the prior speaker, and I like the way that Brendan Kennedy has spoken about it. You know, people go, oh, these, these valuations are crazy. I'll make the case today for why they're maybe not crazy. And I'll make the case today, hopefully, to say, what if in three years, one of us big cannabis companies buys Molson Coors? Why should it go this way and not the other way? So when you look at a Canopy or a Tilray and a Molson Coors, if the bigger guy buys the smaller guys, then the tables are beginning to turn. What tells us that the biggest cannabis companies in the world, as they grow and mature, won't take on pharmaceutical companies, nutraceutical companies, beverage sectors, you know, all of these other vectors that exist. Why do we have to be acquired? Why can't we be like Brendan Kennedy says, the $100 billion company that buys the other guys so that we are Fortune 500, 200, or 100 companies one day, and the fastest growing companies in the world over the next decade will be cannabis companies. We can make that happen, and that's going to require all of us. Quick stroll then down memory lane of cannabis. Um, we know that for 5,000 years, the ancient Egyptians and Chinese used cannabis, all the way to Queen Victoria, all the way really until about 80 years ago, 1937, when cannabis prohibition set in. So it's 5,000 years of history, and you can really dumb the history down to three stages. Legal, illegal, legal. We're now in stage three. That's cannabis 3.0. But are we really? Look at where we are here in the United States. Half of my team had to go in secondary in immigration to ask questions about what exactly we were doing in the cannabis industry and should they really let us in or not. What in the world's going on? H how can that really happen when we are growing an industry that provides hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of jobs? We're based in Calgary. Uh, Calgary is very famous for oil and gas. We're proudly leading the, the, the transformation of that, that state almost 
as we call it, from oil and gas to oil and grass. <laughs> and if we do that right, then the, this area where we operate will become the Silicon Valley of cannabis. As the previous speaker pointed out, Canada has taken the lead of the global industry. And within that are tremendous opportunities, but also tremendous responsibilities. And what the opportunity will be, we really don't know yet, right? There's two countries that are federally legal on the recreational side. There's 30 that are legal on the medical side. There's a hodgepodge here in the United States and actually awesome how you guys operate, but how local the businesses still are. What is this gonna be when it's federally legal in the United States and when it spreads like a marriage around the world? And there's so many steps being taken individually in countries, but also in the industry. And I think in the public eye, they're gonna make that happen that I think we will all see massive benefits from that. Colorado deserves a lot of credit, you know, obviously uh, it seems to be this funny thing that uh, legalization follows me around. Uh, we, live, we lived in Colorado, I was working for Molson Coors at the time when it was legalized in 2014. What an amazing thing, and as we are now experiencing, we experienced it in California uh, when we lived there last year and it was legalized. Um, and obviously now it was just legalized a month ago in, in Canada. Uh, planning to move to China next and then from China over to Japan. <laughs> from Japan down to Australia and then want to get over to Brazil and live there for a while so we can drive the legalization forward. But it is happening, right? And what's really funny is when you've lived in three places where it happened, how the movie replays. I was in Colorado with the long lines and the stores were empty, right? I was in California with the long lines and the stores were empty. I'm in Canada now and the long lines and the stores are empty. So it is pretty incredible. What's cool though is that everybody watched Colorado, the world was going to end. If you remember, read back, you know, December 2013, the Antichrist has taken over, the world's ending, we're all dead. Didn't quite turn out that way. Colorado is doing very well, thank you very much. And I think a lot of the boom in that state was driven by cannabis. And, and not just the cannabis players directly, but tourism. You know, we own some properties in, in ski resorts and I can tell you, best investment I ever made. And that's like building the bars and the Klondike, right? It's, it's the secondary industries that benefit so much from it, not just financially, but employment and opportunities. And Colorado certainly rode that wave. Super proud to be in Canada, you know. Canada has made a decisive step and therefore has an opportunity to create its first global leading industry. And for those of us that are in it, we have the opportunity to build the first global Canadian brands. Legendary, iconic brands in an amazing segment. Name a Canadian global brand. Exactly. So hopefully in three years, that's going to be a little bit different and some of our great brands will be among those. But the opportunity presented is phenomenal. We can't skip though and, and stop for one second and recognize Uruguay for its pioneering spirit of being the first federally legal country that obviously went first. But it's really Canada. It's Canada as the first G20, G G7 country that said, no, we're going we're to go all in. We're going to do this. And they watched Colorado, right? And they saw what happened. And I think they learned many a lesson from what Colorado did. And there is no doubt that now the eyes of the world are on Canada. And they should be. And I think the eyes of the world will be surprised what they see because again, contrary to public belief on October 17th, the Canadian world did not end. The noise that we're making, the problems that we're seeing, what a phenomenal problem to have. We have too much demand. Excuse me? In the industries I come from, there, there is never too much demand. We can't make enough. What? And that's going to last a year or two years or even longer. We really cannot supply enough and the prices are going up and everybody's benefiting. That's our problem. Now it is a problem and it's going to be addressed and the Canadian government and all the stakeholders are doing everything to address it. But these things are expected. We are one step out of the starting block. Nothing ever goes perfect on day one. What's important for us as an industry in every country is that we learn as fast as we can possibly learn and we fix the things that are not working, we make them right and we create a better experience for the consumer. Because ultimately, that's the only thing that matters. The only thing that matters is that in the cannabis industry, like in every other fast moving consumer good industry, the consumer experience will dictate whether the future is bright 
or whether there will be a bust at some point. I strongly believe when I look at the ind industry players and the new entries like Constellation that the premium brand uh, builders are going to take over this industry, not in a negative way, but in a very positive way. So what I want to spend some time on now is share some of the lessons, some of, some of the observations of what this looks like when you put on the lens of a Coca-Cola or a Molson course. So what's working? The legalization benefits are, are undeniable. Whether they're on the social front or they're on the economic front, I think all of those things that proponents of legalization fought for are seeing it come through. State after state, country after country, day after day, um, and that's a phenomenal opportunity for us to make sure that cannabis, indeed, like gay marriage, and probably much faster, spreads around the world so those benefits uh, hit more consumers and more economies around the world. There can't be any doubt about what legalization of cannabis does to the industry in itself, but also to the advertising agencies, the research agencies, the packaging suppliers, the event organizers, the hotels that feed the event organizers, the secondary industries that are really built around the cannabis industry. Um, and in a, in a time where economic growth is hard to come by in many industries, but also in many countries, this is a tremendous opportunity. How much will it add to the GDP in Canada? Hard to say, but I think it's going to do a ton for its reputation, and I really think it's one way for Canada to get in the passing lane and make some significant progress. The other thing that I'm noticing is that as the, as the industry matures, of course, more and more serious players come in. Right? I mean, when I came in, in in January, when I started at Sundial, there wasn't a lot of experienced kind of Fortune 500 senior executives yet in the space. If you look today, there's a lot more coming, whether that's by acquisition, as in the case of Constellation with Canopy, or whether it is by the leaders in the industry recognizing that we need to play to where the puck is going to be, and that experienced players from industries that have been there, that have seen the future, that have lived through the boom, and have learned from the bust, I think can help shape that industry in a very good way. Therefore, as you look out, and I think that's an important thing for us to keep in mind, is we're running down the track so hard every day. Oh, it's so hard. No, hard is when you grow, don't grow for 20 years, or you decline by half. That's hard. Try to figure out where you're going to grow first and how much time you're going to spend so that you can grow even faster. Sure, it's hard, but that's a nice problem to have. So pacing ourselves and making sure that as the opportunities present themselves, we as an industry are prepared and that we're collaborating in creating a healthy industry for all of us and that we don't fight over who gets what size of the pie, but how do we make a bigger pie? That's where I think we should all spend our time. What's not working? I'll bring a, a Canadian perspective here. It's, it's pretty straightforward. You know? it, it is a phenomenal problem to have to say, What's not working is that demand outstrips supply by a multifold. Again, I never thought after my 25-year career that I would ever say that about anything. But here we are. You know, we are in a reality in Canada today where many of the stores are closed and the online stores are either empty or they have three SKUs left. There's literally retailers right now in Canada that are writing automatic ordering bots. So anytime anything becomes available on the website of one of the license, uh, the, the, the boards in the provinces, they can automatically order it. There's literally people right now staring at a screen on the online system and pushing the button as fast as they can to refresh the screen to buy any product that becomes available in the provincial boards. Think about that. That's a job now. You know, the job is order getter. You know, be the one that finds available cannabis first. The provincial boards are competing with each other, calling all of us licensed producers and going, please send me more product. Anything. So that's a phenomenal problem to have, but that one that we have to address. It will be addressed. We're all building a lot of capacity, and, and you know, I want to say nobody more than us, and we are right in the middle of it. Um, but what is not working and what sometimes still makes it a bit challenging, and I see it absolutely as temporary, is the, the regulators just cannot keep up. Health Canada has hired hundreds of people. They can't train them fast enough to keep, keep up with the multiplication of the work that's going on every day in our world. But they're doing the best that they can. Is it good enough? Is it fast enough? No, never. And we're very fortunate. You know, We are uh, well positive cash flow all the way to uh, um, 
all the way to really economic benefit. And so we're not worried about it. But there is dozens, if not hundreds of companies that need the revenue so that they can pay back the bank loans and so they can continue to exist. And there's no doubt the consolidation phase in Canada will come. But I am very co confident that the legislative bodies across Canada and really across the United States, states and ultimately also federally, are going to do everything that they need to do, maybe not at our speed, um, to make that happen. And some of the progress in other countries around the world was mentioned, and it's applaudable. The other thing that I think we all underestimate still is this, this restriction that still exists because of prohibition, basically. The inability over the last 80 years for pharmaceutical companies and for research companies to really understand this crazy cool cannabis plant. 113 cannabinoids in this plant. 113. Name them. <laughs> THC and CBD, good. All right, now the next six or eight, some of us might be able to squeeze them out. The other 100, pff, no idea. We can't name them. We have no idea what they do. We have no idea what they do in combination with each other. We have no idea what they do in combination of each other at different concentrations. We have no idea what they do together or alone in combination with other chemical ingredients. There is decades, if not hundreds of years of research to be done. And I can tell you the research that we're doing with our university partnerships University of Calgary, University of Saskatchewan, and some of the leading research work we're doing down at the University of Lethbridge with Dr. Igor Kovalchuk, it's mind-blowing what's coming out. It's mind-blowing the serious opportunities and the benefit that cannabis can have on millions of consumers, patients, suffering from all kinds of illnesses, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. But those research restrictions need to come down. Federal legalization in the United States will be such an amazing enabler. Right now, I can't tell you how many companies we're talking with that want to do research but can't do it here and are trying to figure out how to do it with us in Canada. When that restriction goes away, poof, a whole nother wave of, of value creation, multiplication, really, is going to take place. For us in Canada right now, I'm a little bit surprised. There's a, a lot of debate about quantity. Um, starts with metrics like, what's your square footage? Excuse me? Like, like the size of the operation will determine success. Well, nothing could be further from the truth. That's just not how success will happen over time. It's not how much bad cannabis you can produce. It's how much great cannabis you can produce. So we need to change the metrics from square footage financed to revenue per square foot of growth space. That's where it needs to go. That's a very different way of looking at it. And we believe that many brands right now in Canada and, and maybe here are really just pushing out as if it's a commodity, if it's, as, as if it's sugar or potatoes. But it's not. It's cannabis, right? And cannabis is probably the most special plant that we know to date. And we've got to play to its strengths in the right way. Understandably, many of the industry players are short-term focused because they're running out of money, because they need to open their store, or they need to get their product on the shelf, and they're missing this license, and they're living hand to mouth. And that's got to happen. But for the future of the industry, it is important that those of us that can afford to do it keep their eye firmly on the horizon and shape an industry that's going to ensure uh, success for all of us for decades to come. So now I want to go through some of my observations as a, as a new entry into cannabis about things that strike me as, as weird. So here's a quiz. Look up at the, uh, at the, at the card, uh, at your screen. Anyone know what this is? Raise your hand if you know. All right, I see two hands. Awesome, three. What am I? I am a tobacco strain. Ever heard of them? Nope. You care? Nope. Neither, to, neither do two billion consumers around the world. The times of buying loose tobacco and then rolling it in a paper, 0.1% market share of self-rolled cigarettes, any parallel to our industry? What are we talking about today? We're, we're talking about strains, right? We're talking about strains that in tobacco we wouldn't even recognize. 
And then what do we call these strains? Hmm. So I'm going to venture the guess that that will not continue. <laughs> but think about how crazy that is, right? Will people really go into a store and say, you got any purple monkey balls? I mean, is that? <laughs> and is that the industry that we want this to be? Is this the industry that the consumers want it to be? Even how you buy it today. This looks like one of these Chinese stores I, I saw in Chongqing that's been there for 2,000 years, you know? And, and not that there is anything wrong with that. I mean, I, there's going to be fragmentation and segmentation. There's many consumers that are going to buy like that, continue to buy like that, and love it. F go at it, right? Yeah, I know. Um, that's a little different. And I can tell you it's going to go that way, right? And it's, it's going to go there quickly. And it's going there. These are, this is real, right? This is a real store down in Florida. Now, to be clear, it's not all going to be Apple stores. And we don't want to take the soul out of this industry either. Because ultimate, ultimately, we believe at Sundial, we're manically obsessed with the product itself. We believe in quads, and we're inventing quints. We want to grow the best cannabis. The cannabis industry is going to win, not if we sell cheaper than the black market and therefore are stomping out the black market. Whoever came up with that concept is badly misguided. We're going to stomp out the black market when the consumer is going to get better value than they did from their current brand. What's their current brand? It's, it's their guy. <laughs> no, that, that's the brand, right? I'm buying from my guy. Cool. Where did it come from? No idea. How do you know that that pet, cat piss name actually does not have correlation to the way that that product was produced? I know, my, my guy says, I, that's, that's a hell of a brand, my guy, right? I think when we can replace my guy with my brand, with a consistent quality, then I think the industry is on the right wicket. It is when you get better value. Price is what you pay, value is what you get. There are consumers out there that are going to pay 20, 30, 50, and $100 a gram. We just haven't given them the opportunity yet. But we will. This industry, with all respect, in some cases, was built by stoners for stoners. Nothing wrong with that. It's a fabulously big industry, and our experienced users are a big part of the cannabis industry today. But when you really look out to the 8 billion people and the 200 countries around the world, it's going to go from this to this, right? It's going to be multi-fragmented segment, and it's going to be consumers, my wife, my kids, myself, my dog, that are going to tie into this industry. And they're going to tie into it in a big way, and all of us differently. But all of us require brands that we can trust and access in a way that makes sense to us. And that segmentation and that sophistication, which doesn't mean that there will still be brands for, for him, but it also means there will be brand for all of these people and animals around the world that are going to shape the future of the industry. What I believe that requires, though, is it requires the entire nomenclature of cannabis to change. Purple monkey balls is one I, I think we should quickly all agree on, should simply be outlawed. But there's other things, right? Do these consumers, these soccer moms or, or these, these creative directors, do they really care? When I'm a new consumer, if I was going to say to my mom, mom with your arthritis, take some CBD, she walks into a Canadian store, and here comes the guy, you know, where the, the ear piercing is connected to the nose piercing, and that runs over the tattooed parrot on the neck, I think my mom is not going to be so comfortable asking for advice. But the smart retailers are realizing that, so their bartenders are as segmented as the users that walk into these dispensaries today. Soccer moms greet soccer moms at the door. Creative types greet creative types at the door. And the experienced users are greeted by experienced users. And everybody gets the consulting and the support that they need. But if you, my mom enters and they go, do you want indica, sativa, or hybrid? My mom is going to go, what did you just say? 
We take that for granted. We think that we need this language. Well, do we, right? And, and how, how do we explain that? And does it really even matter? The strains are all hybrids today, basically. Some more influenced than others, but there is Indica strains that do Sativa's job and Sativa strains that do Indica's job today. Does it really matter still whether they're Indica's and Sativa's? THC and CBD. Mom, do you want THC or CBD? I don't know. I want my arthritis not to hurt me. And that language change, I think, is something that we can learn from the fast-moving consumer goods, consumer packaged goods, good industries. So the way that we do it at Sundial, we actually just define spaces, right? We're talking about a sub-brand that we call Calm and Ease and Flow and Lift and Spark. And yes, from left to right, less CBD to more uh, sorry, more C uh, CBD to more THC. And yes, more Indica on the left and more Sativa on the right. But do they really need to know? And do we need to, should we even expose them to the language? Or should we just understand their motivation and their need as why do they want to go in a store and why do they want to try cannabis an as an alternative to whatever it is they're using right now? Could be aspirin, could be Chardonnay. Why are you wanting to try this? And how do we make sure that when they try, we start them slow and uh, we start them low, we increase them slow? How do we, as the industry leaders, make sure that there's never a bad cannabis experience? We can't avoid it, but education has to be the answer. And it's education by us, the licensed producers, education by the retailers, education by the governments. And that line between marketing and education needs to be redefined. We need to be able to tell those stories, to let the consumers know what it is that they're getting and how they should use it and how the different formats will impact them and how we localize and customize this experience to specifically them and what it is that they're looking for. So think with me about the future language. And when you go into a store, really, is there going to be an Indica and a Sativa and a hybrid shelf and a THC and a CBD section? Or should we not go down the proven route of motivations and need states? At Sundial, we've decided to break our company into three different business units. We call these business units Heal, Help, and Play. Play, Adult Use Recreational Cannabis. A lot has been said about it. I'll talk a little bit more about it. And it's fantastically big, and we're spending a lot of effort on there. We've also spent a lot of time about talking about HEAL, the medical side of the business. I heard earlier the projection is going to decline. Mm. Let's compare in five years where we will be on the HEAL side, where prescription is required. And right now, how many approved uh, drugs are there? One? How many will there be in five years? 50? How many will there be in 10 years? Hundreds? Do you really think the heel part of our industry is going to decline? I would wager that that's not going to happen. And then it's been sexy to talk about hemp. But again, listen to our own language, right? It's medical or medicinal and recreational adult use and CBD and hemp. And the consumer doesn't give a shit about any of that. They really don't, right? They use cannabis to heal, to help them with their general well-being, or to play. We believe that, and that's the way that we're going to operate it, and it's hopefully something that the industry can get behind, and where we tell stories consistently and we give consumers access to our brands and make this less scary for them than it is today. If we do that, there is no limit to how far we can go. A couple of other uh, favorite peeves. We've had dozens of banks and analysts talk to us over the last couple of weeks and months. If I hear one more time the question, so when are supply and demand going to overlap and how are you going to survive once the prices are going to, going to go down, I think I'm going to just throw up because it's, it's just such a, an unsophisticated view of such a sophisticated industry. And if you walk to the dispensaries here, I think you will see that in Cannabis 2.0 today, the segmentation is at least in a good, better and best kind of category. And as we see that in Canada in the provincial boards and the retailers, what strikes us is the pricing at a wholesale level roughly in Canada. Good under four, better four to five, best over five. Well, I can tell you one thing. Everybody now is only selling best because there is no cannabis in Canada. So everyone that has any product is selling it to the bigger, for the biggest amount that they can get. So it's all best. But look at the price segment inside of that. Four, four to five, and five. How tight is that? 
What can we learn from the experienced industries? Look at wine. And don't worry so much whether it's four, six, eight, or, or 10 different segments. But look at the price points. Look at where it starts with extreme value and value in that $4 wine range, and look how it goes up to iconic of 200. Contrast that with us, four to five. That's crazy. The consumers want more variety. The connoisseurs in the cannabis industry want really, really good cannabis. So what we're proposing and what we're driving towards is to say, no, we have to spread that out for a healthy industry. It has to go from three segments and in very tight price points to at least five and ultimately seven or nine or 10. The most exciting part in this industry will be best and what we for now call craft. It will be in the higher price segments. And what's the most expensive gram you can buy today? I think it's $27. That's going to be a joke when we're going to sell $100 grams within a year. And when our master growers take 1,000 grams and only the top flower and the best one with special curing, and they make that into a phenomenal product, that's a limited edition that the consumers will kill to have, where we create scarcity because it is, because there is not unlimited supply. And the point about when are supply and demand going to overlap, the answer is never. Is there ever too much Chateau Lafitte or Mouton Rothschild? Do the prices ever go down for the best brands in the world in whiskey and wine and all of these industry? No, they don't, and they never will. When you look at the capacity that's being created today, everybody talks about low cost producer status. Oh, I can make it for 70 cents a gram. See, an, idi an idiotic conversation. The way that production costs should be measured is as a percentage of your net sales revenue. If I can sell it at $7 and I have to spend 10 cents more than the guy that sells it for $3 and I have costs of goods that are 10 cents higher, well, hell, that's the best investment I can ever make. So this discussion of quantity versus quality needs to massively course correct. It is directly linked to the quality of your production. And when the majority of players build mass facilities for lowest possible cost, not for highest possible quality, that is not a good thing for the industry. So we're going to swim aggressively against that stream, and we are going to create quads and invent quins. And all of our product will not be irradiated. What, when that language enters, how much, what percentage of cannabis is irradiated? Do we want that to be irradiated once, twice, four times? Is irradiation a good thing for the industry? Is that consumer language that we want to we wanna enter into? And what does that all mean for us as responsible producers? So we're super excited about it. I mean, uh, look out for our $100 grams next year. It's going to be a hell of a ride. Um, but we're going to squeeze that way out. And it's not so much about the money making. It's about the brand creation opportunities and the excitement in a segment. So let's not race this thing to the bottom. Let's instead create fantastic product that deserves fantastic prices so consumers have fantastic experiences. When we do that, how high is high? It's incredible to imagine that in, in a place like Aspen, last year, 2017, within three years of legalization, cannabis outsold total alcohol combined. That is wine, beer, and liquor. More cannabis was sold in Aspen than all alcohol combined, three years after legalization while it's federally illegal. And 90% of consumers haven't tried. How high will high be? And in preparation for this, I, I really looked for how big is global cannabis going to be down the road? There's no numbers. I'm excited to see that people are talking about 2030. Here in the United States, cannabis sales are forecasted to pass uh, soft drinks, my old world, by 2030. Anyone want to take a bet? I'll take a bet that it's going to be as early as five years before that. It might be 2025. Because remember what we're not doing. It's still not federally legal. We haven't explored the medical side with these life-changing drugs that will be created. We haven't really explored the play side of health and wellness to the extent that we will. When all of these things take shape, it'll be a hell of a ride. So I looked for the number. How big is it going to be in 2050? Anybody ever tried? Global, 2050? There's no data out there. So here's what we did. We said, all right, start somewhere. Current Colorado per capita is $273 per year. If we then say, let's grow that with inflation, 
We're only growing 15%, so it's conservative. It's still growing. Medical is not developed. The, the help side is not even there. So I think growing it with inflation would be conservative. By the way, for healthy industry dynamics, responsible consumption, growing pricing with or above inflation, the alcohol industry has been doing it for decades, is a very good thing for everybody. So that's one thing to watch out for. So if we grow it with inflation, and then we make an assumption that by 2050, North America will be at current, at current Colorado levels, which are still growing at 15%. So, so there's space in there. And then you go, okay, now what do I assume about the rest of the world? Well, I'm going to assume this. I'm going to assume that 32 years from now, Europe is going to be at 80% of North America. The way it looks, it might be higher than North America, but start somewhere. Let's say South America, Latin America is going to be at half of North America. You can play with the numbers anytime, anything, any way you want. Let's say Asia is going to be at 30%. I mean, you've seen some of the CBD beverages already being sold in Japan, one of the most profitable markets for countries like Coca-Cola. You could argue it should be much higher because of China and India. I'm saying, all right, take 30%. Take Africa at 10% of North America. Although in 30 years, wouldn't the rest of the world have caught up and won't the economic redistribution continue? So if you take those assumptions, what do you get? You get a $2 trillion industry. Two trillion dollars. Now you might say, ah, 30 years, you'll be dead. That's probably true, but <laughs> Facebook, I think it's 25 years today. I think Google is 20 years today. I think Tesla is 15. So companies that didn't exist in the time span I'm talking about are now shaping the global industry, not just in their segments, but they are the most valuable companies around. So if you take those $2 trillion and you look at the current share prices of even the, the, the industry players and you add them all up, I think it adds up to about $60 billion market capitalization. So you have $60 billion worth of companies going after a $2 trillion future size of the price. Let's all buy some cannabis shares because it's going to be a hell of a ride. The net present value of the $2 trillion is enormous and of course, we're in the baby steps. We're in two countries with play and a few states here, uh, I think 10 now. We're beginning to break through prohibition and the research learnings that will come on the heel side. We haven't even scratched the surface of the help opportunity. That is not in the $2 trillion. We have one FDA approved drug today. There'll be hundreds. By, by, by 2050, there'll be thousands. 95% from the Deloitte study, 95% of consumers of cannabis reduce their painkiller consumption. What can cannabis do for opioid replacement? Forget how much money it saves, but the life-changing opportunities for patients and families afflicted by this horrible disease and addiction. The good that it can do on the extreme side of drugs, on the other side of it, aspirin replacement. Shit, how big's the aspirin market? It's huge. We can access all of that. 82% of cannabis consumers re reduce or stop consuming alcohol. And if I'm an alcohol company, I mean, not only am I really worried, but I'm really trying to figure out how to get into cannabis as Constellation and Molson Coors have already done. 12% stop drinking. I would assume those are heavy consumers, right, if they switch over. And what about the soccer moms when they walk into a store and they trade in their couple of glasses of Chardonnay for a cannabis product of their choice. Remember cannabis, you can inhale it, you can ingest it, and you can absorb it. Alcohol, hmm, good luck. And I think the alcohol companies, when they're forecasting 20 to 30% of cannabis will be consumed, it's a little bit the guy with a hammer that sees every problem as a nail. If cannabis consumers wanted to drink it, they'd be drinking it. And the rounding error that these numbers represent at the moment are really just that, rounding errors. I think 1.6 is the highest number that I've seen, right? Will it get bigger? It'll get bigger. But consumers in this business are going to inhale and ingest it, and that's not necessarily going to be through beverages, because you're going to have to make a beverage that tastes great. They don't want to drink it just because it has cannabis in it. So a lot of opportunity to be created. And then we're really in, in this stage of saying, well, gosh, which other vectors does cannabis touch? Pharmaceuticals, nutraceuticals, cosmeceuticals. And on the other side, beverages, tobacco, and food. All of these industries we intersect with, all of them are trillion-dollar industries. 
And all of those are opportunity spaces for cannabis that we will increasingly tap into. Many of my fellow CEOs will probably agree the toughest thing for us leading these large companies is balancing strategic complexity with our capability to execute. There's so many opportunities that we all are loading up the donkey cart as if there's unlimited capacity on the donkey cart. But there isn't, and we're spending a ton of time right now proudly saying no and sequencing opportunity and setting up different business units so we can walk and chew gum at the same time. Because if we keep adding to the strategic complexity on the donkey cart, inevitably, you're gonna run out of kilter. And there is many companies that are jacking themselves up because they're just making it too hard. They're trying to do everything, and by doing everything, they're doing nothing well. And that's a huge watch out for us. So in summary, what will it take in 3.0? We've got to think and act beyond the current day, and the leaders, um, those of us that are fortunate enough to have financing as still being private at this point in time, um, or by already being public and having access to the resources, we need to take that responsibility seriously and shape an industry for the future good of everybody. We never have a second chance to make a first impression. We gotta focus on safety and quality and trust. Let's never allow a bad consumer experience with any cannabis products. Let us all work together to grow a fantastic pie, and whether that is us LPs or the retailers, the government stakeholders, the press, all of us should think about how do we ensure superior consumer experiences. And all, all that together, I think, will shape very healthy industry dynamics that everybody, from the consumers to the participants, will benefit in. Let's remember that with this great opportunity comes great responsibility on many fronts, quality being one of them. But right now, this industry is built for speed, we're going to have to recalibrate at a moment in time and make sure that our ecologic, fo ecologic fo footprints uh, are in line with our ambitions and at Sandal we're working towards water and power neutrality because we owe the planet that. That's the responsibility that we all have. So hopefully this little sprint through the world of what does cannabis look like through the eyes of a mature industry and, and in this case my eyes having been on the other side of the world was somewhat entertaining and eye-opening sets the stage for you to go run here over the next three days and in your respective industries i thank you for your time <laughs>